What is the difference between the best and the rest? Between the legendary and the ordinary? Even between the superstars and the stars, what separates them? You see, that was the question burning in my mind since the age of 12. Because at 12 years old, my grandfather had motor neuron disease. Now, motor neuron disease is a very crippling condition. He lost all motor function. He couldn't walk from one room to the next. He couldn't barely talk, and he definitely couldn't feed himself. So being a naive 12-year-old, being exposed to that for the first time was a real eye-opener, and it gave me a wake-up call. A wake-up call that we're actually all mortal. And that was the first time I actually realized that, at 12 years old. And that, there was one problem, though. And there was one real problem from that. I had this desire, this motivation, to use that you know, epiphany that I just had to do something meaningful and with impact. I wanted to make sure that the life that I did live left something behind that was substantial. The biggest issue I had, though, was I had crippling social anxiety. In fact, at just three years old, I was kicked out of kinder for being too shy. Can you imagine that? You're a three-year-old boy or a three-year-old girl, and your kindergarten teacher tells, says to your mom, don't bring Ethan back here tomorrow because he's too shy. Who says that to a three-year-old? It's crazy. But that was the thing. I was so shy. And that stayed with me my whole entire life. Until 12, 16, 18, high school, middle school, I was crippled by this social anxiety. And the question I would always get is, why are you so quiet? Why is he so quiet? Why don't you talk? And to be honest, I couldn't answer that. The way I answered it was with silence. I honestly had no idea why I was like that. It wasn't me consciously trying to be quiet. It was just the process that was happening. Even around my friends or my family at the dinner table, the Christmas dinner table, I couldn't ask my closest family or relatives to pass over the salad or pass over the chicken or whatever dish it was. I was that anxious. And I, I really wanted to be successful, though. So I was like, there has to be a way to overcome this. Successful people have all overcome some kind of weakness, some kind of deficiency. So how can I get over this thing? And the answer to that question, I would later find, actually he had tucked away in the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind, a compilation of your past conditioning, how you've been parented, how you've been brought up, your teachers, your close friends, your close family, the mainstream media, social media, all of those influences combine to actually bias your actions every day. And you see, it's kind of this process that, that happens. We get exposed to a stimuli. And usually, that's either an opinion of, of, that someone has about you, or it's an experience that you have. So someone might tell you, hey, you're actually very bad at maths, or you're not that good at running, or maybe you put your hand up at school when you're a three-year-old kid, and you try to ask, answer a question, and the teacher tells you you're wrong, and you get embarrassed. So you repress that emotion, you repress that negative feeling. So this stimuli comes, becomes a conscious thought. You think about it. Maybe if I had just changed the way I said this, Maybe if I did this instead of that. All these ruminating thoughts go in your conscious brain. Now, the more you think about it, the deeper that conscious thought becomes subconscious. And once that happens, it has a much more deeper impact on your everyday behavior and, and ability to perform at your best level. Now, once that subconscious thought takes over, it then it dictates your actions. So someone says you're bad at maths, that's now a subconscious thought, and now your action is not to try as hard at that subject or at whatever you're bad at, because someone told you that. You see, the opinion, the experience, becomes your reality. And unfortunately, that action dictates your result. So now you don't try as hard at maths, and you get a worse result at maths. And that actually reinforces the initial false belief. You see, we're wired for success, but we are programmed for failure. Because of this conditioning cycle that's going on every single day in our lives. And they form what we call baseline assumptions. Baseline assumptions, the way you actually see the world, the belief systems that you subconsciously have that bias your behavior. So some common ones are, I'm not going to be happy until I achieve whatever it is. The baseline assumption is, you're not happy now. So why can't you be happy now? Why is your baseline assumption that you're not happy? Another one is that all people are out to get me. 
Speaking up in class means I'll get rejected or, or I'll get embarrassed. These are all baseline assumptions that people have and they hold. Now some of us, most of us actually, have had 20, 30, 40, 50 years with this wrong information, this incorrect opinion or experience that we had as a child or, or as we're growing up that's dictating the, the way we, rest, we live the rest of our lives. We're following the wrong map. Now consider this, today we're in Melbourne. Now if someone was to give to you a map at five years old and it was a map of New York, and they said to you, find your way around Melbourne with this map. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how many people you ask for help. It doesn't matter if you go on YouTube to find out how to read maps. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You have the wrong map, you're going to the wrong place. The blueprint is wrong. But unfortunately for many of us, that's what we're following. That's how we're wired. Because our primal brain wants us to be safe and comfortable. It only cares about, about our survival. It doesn't care if we thrive. That's how we're wired, because the primal brain has been evolutionary since hundreds of millions of years ago. We have had all these experiences, and in the tribal times, in the caveman times, when humans were just becoming human, there were many threats. There were different tribes trying to take our resources. There were animals that could have killed us easily. If you miss one threat in that caveman times, you would lose your survival. So the primal brain had to evolution itself to only care about your survival, not your thrival or not, and not your personal growth. We're wired to detect threats more than we are to detect opportunities. And there's this one part in the brain called the habenula that actually causes most of this. See, the habenula is very useful. When you're a kid and you touch a hot pan and you get burnt, the habenula reminds you never to try that again. But in today's society, it actually serves as a distraction. Because if you try to start a new business and it fails, if you try to talk to someone new and try to be social and you get rejected or embarrassed, the habenula is training you not to make the same mistake again. That part of the brain is stopping you from trying what could actually be a positive behavior because of that conditioning. And it might seem, look, we're, all, like, we're wired like this, and might, maybe it's all doom and gloom for us. But actually, it's not. And there's one key thing that the best in their industry, the best in their field, they all have. And they've all kept. It's instinct. It's instinct versus overthinking. You see, the best in their field, they trust their instinct and their gut feel. But most of us today, we overthink things, we overanalyze things. We try to make the most out of a situation where we don't need a logic, we don't need to make it logical. It's just, it just is. Consider this. All of us are born with this instinct. Consider a baby. When a baby gets hot, when it gets cold, when it gets tired, when it gets hungry, it screams until it gets what it wants. You can't reason with the baby that it's wrong. It doesn't really care. It knows what it wants, it's going to scream until it gets that. That's instinct. Then the adults come along and they say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know, don't eat this now, you have to wait until this happens, go sit over there. The adults bring the logic into it. And we lose our instinct. No wonder we've lost our instinct. Instead of doing what you're, you're actually naturally supposed to do, you started doing what you were told to do. No wonder we've lost our instinct. You see, the best in their field don't lose their instinct. Now, when I was just, when I had that crippling social anxiety, this was me at 14 years old, 16 years old. I grew my hair out so long because I wanted to hide. I couldn't face a social interaction. This was a way of me coping with that. I had lost my instinct. But this was the most crippling time of my life because I was at a crossroads where I really, really, really wanted to do something impactful. So I, I said to myself, how is it possible that, how can I overcome this? How is it possible so many successful people seem to transcend talent altogether? So I studied extremely hard into what's called success attribution. Now, success attribution is all about trying to predict what will make someone successful over someone else. And most people, what they find is that talent, being skills, genetics, good looks, maybe it's IQ, or maybe it's just luck, plus the measurement of that talent, 
For example, exams, tests, for athletes, it's draft combines, maybe it's beauty pageants. So talent plus measurement of talent should hypothetically equal success. But what's very interesting is for the most successful people, the ones that transcend their industry altogether, they don't fit this formula. Because for them, talent plus measurement of talent equals stifledness in creativity, it equals conformity, and it equals confinement. And do you know why? It's because those that transcend their industry, yes, they have some talent, but they have something much more important than talent. They have a weakness or a deficiency. The ones that transcend this formula altogether, the ones that don't fit in that box of talent plus measurement of talent, they transcend success with their weakness and their core deficiency. My weakness was the crippling social anxiety. I couldn't talk to people. So initially, to overcome that, I had to learn a skill that would make sure I could still impact someone and impact the world without having to be social, which for me was creating a company that was online. And now I have clients over five different continents, and that's worked extremely well. I even failed university. This is the letter they send to you when you fail. I failed first year at this university. I then, from there, went to speaking all over the world in front of thousands of people. All over the world. I, had to, I wanted to make my own business because I didn't want to get a job because I don't want to talk to people. That was my <laughs> crippling social anxiety. That's just how it works. That's how bad it was. So I forced myself to use that weakness that gave me that extra chip on my shoulder. I now teach at the same university that failed me. <laughs> I started teaching there before I even graduated. But look, digital marketing was nice, but it was never enough. Because I, I had social anxiety in person, not online. I wanted to overcome that in person. So one of my baseline assumptions was that I could never be a public speaker. Because think about this. Most speakers, they rely on networking and, and connections to find stages to speak on, to find people to speak with, and they get invited. They wait around, wait around. Someone pr promotes them and hires them to speak on their stage. I could never rely on that because I was socially, you know, honestly a bit socially weird. I couldn't rely on my network or my connections. So I had to use my skill set to create my own events all over the world. You'll see this, this is a four-week period. Singapore, Malaysia, Los Angeles, San Diego, back to Singapore, back to Malaysia in four weeks, my own event, my own branding, my own marketing. Anywhere in the world I want to go to, I can do the same marketing and fill up a room. Most speakers that don't have my weakness, they can't do that. They don't have the drive or the chip on their shoulder to do that. My weakness, my deficiency made me so scarred that I had to learn a way to transcend the successful model altogether. And it's not just me, it's a, it's a lot, a lot of celebrities and famous people that have had a core weakness or deficiency that have used that to transcend success altogether. Walt Disney was fired from his first job because he was not creative enough and he lacked imagination. Walt Disney. <laughs> Apparently his weakness was not being creative enough. I mean, we all know what Disney is today. Oprah Winfrey, she was fired from her first job because she showed too much emotion. She was the wrong color, the wrong size. She wasn't fit for television. Oprah Winfrey is now a billionaire because of her emotional connection with her audience. Her biggest weakness that they said was her weakness is her biggest strength. Tom Brady is an NFL player. And when they draft NFL players, they have like a list of things that they think of that person. And for Tom, they wrote these things up there. Poor build, skinny, lacks a strong arm. He's slow. Yes, Tom was all those things. He was physically deficient. So why is he the only player to win six Super Bowls in the history of the NFL? It's because his core physical deficiency or his core physical weakness forced him to be creative and see things that other players simply would not see. He was physically deficient. He had to be creative and mentally strong to overcome that and transcend success. And for someone that's physically weak, he's now one of the best players of all time. And the list goes on. We could be here for hours going through the list of people that have achieved and transcended their industry 
with their core weakness. Because it isn't talent that we need. And I'm sure all of you today can think about one or two weaknesses, one or two deficiencies that you believe you have that someone has maybe told you you have. You don't need talent. You need a little bit of talent, but more importantly, you need a weakness. If you want to transcend that industry, you need to have a weakness. And then you turn that weakness, and instead of allowing it to, to control your subconscious, you make that weakness conscious. You bring awareness into that weakness. Because once there is awareness and consciousness in that weakness, you can act upon it. And you can turn it into your strength and transcend success, just like all of these people have behind me. Because once you're aware of that, once you're aware that it's not your strength, but it's actually your weakness that's going to drive you, the weakness isn't a weakness at all. It's a perceived weakness. And it is your biggest perceived weakness that will propel you straight to the top. Thank you.